Remember the vintage electronics find from last year? Well, this is a Zenith console stereo from that find. We're going to restore it today and get it up and running. Welcome to Hack a Week. <laughs> You're looking at the Zenith model SFD 2505WT console stereo. Let's take a look inside. Needs a little refinish on the top. We'll take care of that. We got a turntable and we've got a tuner, AM and FM. And uh, this one had what's called uh, AFC, which was automatic frequency control that kept the channel from drifting after you tuned it in. And there it is, the uh, high fidelity. Cobra-matic Zenith stereophonic turntable with the exclusive uh, Zenith Cobra tone arm. And they put two little eyeballs on it because the tone arm looks like a snake. Pretty funny stuff. Over here we have the controls, treble, uh, bass, and up here's the loudness and the stereo balance on a dual pot. That's how I know it's from 1960. I think that might have been uh, in the store display. Got a cloth in here to clean the record. This is the original store receipt. Let's see, this was purchased at B&B uh, Appliance, Lakeshore Drive, Cleveland, Ohio, 216-1960. And back then they paid $247.20, which right now doesn't seem like a whole lot of money, but in 1960, $247 had the same buying power as $1,900 does now in 2014. Really puts things in perspective, huh? Well, let's take a look at the uh, owner's manual that came with this now and the uh, service manual. Zenith console radio record player. What do we got in here? This is the... Uh, Let's see, installation of the 45 RPM spindle, the instructions for that. It's really neat to have all the paperwork that came with stuff like this. Installation and operating guide. Everything you need to know right there. Wow, cool. Look at that. It's even got the hookup diagram for the uh, internal wiring. You know, I love that about older stuff. It actually came with things that helped the user get right in there and do stuff with. This came on the turntable. Um, showed you all the, the stuff about the uh, needle set down, selecting the speed, load, start, tone arm lock, all that. How to, how to operate basically the turntable. And then here's the operating guide for uh, the whole radio section and the turntable, everything else. How to set it up for optimal listening. It comes with uh, external speaker uh, connector, I think. We'll find that out later. Now this is neat. FM, radio at its finest. A simple explanation of frequency modulation. This tells you all about how FM works instead of AM, which was amplitude modulation. Want to find out more about that, Google those two things and do some reading. So here's the uh, Service manual. What? Service manual? Yeah, that's right. Some of this stuff came with a service manual for the service man. And this guy was a ham radio operator, so I'm guessing he special ordered this because he wanted to be able to work on it himself. Again, there's that hookup diagram. And take a look at that. A schematic. And after last week's episode, you should know how to read this. Of course, this has tubes in it. We didn't go over the tube... Uh, symbols did we well we'll do that sometime but there it is there's the whole schematic pretty basic stuff really not a whole lot to it and what else 1960 more proof that it's ancient see it looks to me like this uh it shows these speakers out here like maybe you had the option to mount them further outboard i'm not sure how that worked or maybe extra speakers came with it i don't know anyway Here's more diagrams for uh, different ones that you could buy, different models, I guess. And then there's a parts list, all that stuff. So that's pretty cool to have that. 
And it's gonna be handy because we're gonna get inside there and uh, clean things up a little bit. The pots are a little bit scratchy. The turntable, it works, but it's a little sluggish. It needs a little bit of cleaning. It needs a new needle and cartridge, which I already ordered. And uh, let's see, today is Tuesday. So hopefully by the weekend, before the video goes up, we'll have that cartridge here and we can put that in and get this thing working. But right now, we're gonna jump into the back of the unit and take a look at what's inside. Before we get in the back and uh, poke around at things, let's turn this on so you can uh, hear what it sounds like. I've had it on a minute ago. It'll take a minute to warm up. Got a classical station tuned in. But it does work, as you can see. Uh, let's try tuning some different stations here. Three decades or more. What the president's going to focus on tonight is not just one of the symptoms of three. And we got the volume control over here. It sounds pretty good. Everything works okay. The bass control works all right. Treble works fine. Let's turn that off and go to the phono and see what that does. I've got an old Frank Sinatra record on here. Let's push it on. Is it even rotating? Yeah, it is. It might be a little sticky on the automatic control. There comes the tone arm up. The record should drop now. And the tone arm should come over. Oh, it's having a hard time. It's a little sluggish. Oh, see, it's not quite lined up right. We gotta take care of that. Oh, and it's on 45. We want 33. Slow that down. And it works, but it doesn't sound as good as it could because that cartridge is pretty old. Let's hit the reject. See if it'll shut off okay. Yep, there goes the tone arm. Should drop down and the motor turns off. Okay, that's good. So the uh, the cartridge has um, a ceramic element in it that gets vibrated by the needle. And um, that needle is held in place by a thing like this that looks like a yoke and it wiggles back and forth with the grooves of the record. That yoke is made out of rubber and with time the rubber starts to dry up. It isn't as flexible as it used to be and you start to lose some of the fidelity. So we'll get into more about the uh, the needle and the cartridge later when I get the uh, cartridge here. We'll talk a little bit more about that. But for uh, for now, there you go. There's a little simple demonstration of it. Let's get in the back where the goodies are. The entire back of the unit uh, is a big piece of perf board. Not the kind you do electronics on, but uh, basically just a uh, hard board with lots of holes in it for ventilation. And here are the external uh, speaker hookups for radial sound. God, I love the terminologies they used to use that made things sound so high tech. Well, not so much different than we do now. But anyway, there's the uh, plugs for that. The way these work is you would pull that plug out and you would plug in the external speaker there. Let's see, right here is the antenna connector uh, for an external outdoor antenna, if you wish. There's everything about the model number, etc. How many amps and watts and volts and all that that it runs at. What we need to do is take all these screws out that are around the outside here and then we can pull the back off. Looks like somebody had a kitty cat that liked to uh, scratch on this, had a good time with it, and nearly tore a bagel hole in it. <laughs> Pretty funny. This does not have a power interlock cable, as they used to call it. Some of the uh, units after the mid-60s started to put uh, the plug on the back in such a way that when you pulled the back off, the plug came with it. But if you were a service person, you would take that plug off from the back with a little clip and then you can plug it in and do service on it. So let's get the back off and see what's going on in there.
over here on the right side of the unit is the audio amplifier. There's five tubes in there that do all the work. You can see the great big black transformer in the back there. And I can't mention this enough about tubes. They run on some pretty high voltages. So if you ever get inside and do anything like this, you do so at your own risk and be really careful. There are some high voltages and you want to make sure that one of the leads of the uh, power supply is not tied out to the chassis right here. I've got one of my continuity tester leads connected right here and if I touch it here you hear the beep and um, you can't see me do this I'm doing it off camera but if I touch uh, either one of the leads of the plug that goes in the wall I don't get a beep so I'm pretty sure it's not tied out to this the danger in that is if you were to plug it in these leads uh, back in the old days were not polarized you can see that 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 plug will pretty much go in either way into the socket so if one of these is tied out to the chassis then you could potentially have a hot lead making the entire chassis hot and if you're working in a shop with a concrete floor and you're barefoot and you touch that and it's plugged in guess what you're a path to ground you're gonna get a really nasty shock and you could potentially um, die <laughs> So be really careful around tubes. Um, read up on how to do testing on them before you go messing around with anything. And if we go diving down underneath here, let's get inside a little deeper. There's the mid-range speaker. It has a crossover capacitor on it that uh, filters out the bass. Down there is the woofer. And these run straight through. These are just magnetic type drivers. They're not uh, the really old ones. This is the phonograph section and uh, what I would like to do here is tap into that output right there, those wires, they come from the cartridge and put those on a mini uh, stereo jack so that I can plug an MP3 player in. Basically have an auxiliary input so I can play CDs or MP3s over this old school tube amp which is kind of fun. The entire turntable section can lift out it's spring mounted. It's kind of a shock absorbing thing. If I bounce it, you'll see what I mean. It's the whole thing's mounted on springs. That way when somebody goes stomping across the floor, it doesn't make the record skip. And the way that you pull these out is these little widgets right here. Let me see if I can get in here close enough that you can see this. Um, kind of difficult to do and not block my light, but right there, if I flip that like that, now that can push up through that hole and I can I can lift it out the top. So I need to do that to both of those. There should be another one over there. Yeah, there it is, let's see. Let me flip that up. Okay. Now I can lift that uh, lift that thing out the top. Before we pull out that turntable, let's take a look at the tuner. This is over on the left side, the tuner chassis. All those silver boxes you see right there, those are all RF coils, radio frequency coils. There's, uh, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven tubes in this, on this chassis. Right there's the uh, variable capacitor. That's how the tuning is done. And what else is in there that we either want to look at? Oh yeah, the antenna. There's the onboard antenna, that winding right there on that strip. And of course over here is the woofer and uh, mid-range on this side. So now we'll go back up to the top and get that turntable out. I need to disconnect a few wires before I lift that turntable out. The uh, lead right here for the cartridge runs over to the amp. It's just a three pin plug that just pulls out. This is the power supply right here for the uh, motor. Of course, I've got everything unplugged right now when I'm doing this. Now we can take that out the top. Let's get this 45 RPM adapter out of the way. This should just lift right up and out of here. And we can get it on the workbench. Now that we've got this on the workbench, it's a little easier to work on. So the uh, turntable platter comes off by removing this little circlip right here. It's a little E clip. Let's pop that out of the way. We'll put that aside. And I should be able to just lift this up and take it off. And there we go. There's the drive wheel right there. 
and it just rubs against the lip right here on the on the platter or the, the platen as some people call it there's a little bit of oil here and a little teeny bearing this washer came off with it I'm going to drop that back on just to make sure it stays in there the various speeds it's really quite simple the way these work the the speeds are controlled by the spindle of the motor which is stepped um, let's see let me draw you a quick little picture here on the fly so the motor is like this and it's got steps to it that's the shaft of the motor itself and then the uh, the wheel rubs against that and so depending on which one of these that it's lined up with it'll spin faster or slower because of the different size on the spindle and that's controlled right here by this and it just moves the motor up and down it's really quite simple so when I go to 16 RPMs, it's on the smallest one. 33 is that one, and 45, and 78, etc., all the way on up. So that's the way that works. Now this part right here, this rubber wheel, um, has gotten a bit hardened up, but it's still pretty, pretty pliable. But it wouldn't hurt to just clean it off, maybe with a, a little bit of alcohol. Um, I want to put too much on because that'll dry out the rubber but just something to wipe off some of the crud a little bit that's really all I need to do to that the motor seems to spin pretty freely so I think I'm okay there uh, this thing isn't really too sticky what it really needs is to just be run um, just use it because it hasn't been used for quite a while now the tone arm will will lock into place with this little clip right here if I push down on it and then when I flip it over it won't go flying all over the place but here's the mechanism underneath that uh, makes everything go all of this mechanical stuff right here as the thing rotates and you you move this little cams and things come into play and cause that tone arm to raise up and move over it's actually a, a pretty complicated looking little mechanism but it more or less was the same on all these type turntables. They all pretty much work the same way. So really all I'm going to do to this is uh, just clean off that rubber wheel a little bit. And um, I don't think I'm really going to put too much lube and crud all over here because that will just attr attract dust. Mostly what this needs is to get that wheel clean so that it spins the, the platter. And the platter spinning and the gear drive that you see right there in the middle of it that's what drives this and makes the whole mechanism do its thing so if I get that cleaned up and spinning really well this should just come back to life and work just fine and we'll stick it back in and move along get a little alcohol and a q-tip wipe this wheel clean Ooh, yuck see what comes off from it just a little bit of black oxidized rubber it'll just make it turn the platter a little bit easier Seamus has found a nice cozy spot on the workbench to hang out I'm testing tubes I've got this uh, really cool uh, tube tester that somebody gave me a few weeks ago and did a little searching online and found a PDF of the operating manual gives you all the instructions how to use it and how to set it for all kinds of tubes there's just a bunch of pages of listings of tubes and where to set everything up these are the two main amplifier tubes for the left and right channels out of the zenith they are 6bq5 tubes and uh, one of the channels sounds a little weak so we're going to test those tubes out and see if they're okay so here's the Electronic Measurements Corporation Model 213 tube tester. I've got it plugged in. Let's take one of these tubes and plug it into the proper socket. There's two parts to the test. The first one is a short test, as in short circuit. And what you do is you take these switches and just start flipping them up one at a time and you look for the light to light up. Now right there, number one does light up, but according to my little chart over here, um, it will light up which means that there's simply continuity um, within the tube on uh, pin one so that's okay it's supposed to light up like that and then if I go 
to, it goes back out. What I'm looking for is a light to stay on when all of these are turned on. And the light does not stay on. So that's good, there's no shorts in it. If there was a short, then we wouldn't wanna go further because that could potentially damage my tube tester. Now we'll move on to the quality test. The first place we need to go is the uh, filament selection, uh, which number that has to be. That's on four for this particular tube. The filament volts we set to D, which I think was 8.3 volts. And then these switches down here have to be set. And let me see, let me check my chart here. And we have to have one, two, and nine turned to the P position. Then we want to take the shunt knob, which is simulating a load or or usage of the thing, and we'll turn that up. Oops, got to put it on quality. And then we'll turn that up to 22. Hmm. It's in the red. Red says replace. So that tube is a little sketchy. All right, let's try the other tube. Okay, other tube is in there. Heater's warmed up. One, two, and five will glow, so that's okay. Flip all the switches up. The light's not glowing, so we don't have any short circuits. Let's flip all those back down. These settings are all okay, we'll leave those alone. The shunt is back to zero. Let's put it on quality, and let's turn the shunt Oops, we gotta switch these on too. That's right, almost forgot. There's a lot going on here when you do this. Uh, 6BQ5, let's see, we need one, two, and nine turned on. Let's turn the shunt up to 22. And that one's showing just barely good. So that's why my sound quality is suffering just a little bit. Here's a 12AX7. I just tested a 12AU7 and that tested fine. It was way up here in the good. This 12AX7 is just a little bit sketchy. It's um, it's it's good, but it's a little borderline. And since I'm going to order some new tubes, I might as well add that one to my list. Okay, that's the last of them. Tested everything in the uh, AM FM receiver section and in the amp section. And it looks like all I need to get is three tubes. I need two 6BQ5s and one 12AX7. Let's go back to that tone arm for a minute and see if we can get it to line up right with the record. Sometimes it lands in the right spot, sometimes it doesn't. There is an adjustment for that. Now see, it's fallen off to the side that way, so we need to get in there and adjust that. I hit the reject button so that it'll park back there by itself. Now let's see. I found this in the uh, operating manual, there, right down here, let's see, right there. There's a screw right there that you turn and that will actually change where the tone arm uh, position is relative to the record. Let's see, let's give that a little turn counterclockwise, just a little bit, and let's give it another try. Well, landed okay that time. We'll try it a few more times just to make sure it lines up all right. After a few more adjustments, I think we've got it. Got about four or five times in a row here now of it landing where it's supposed to. That's it. I think our little cobra head is right on the money. That's about it for this week because I don't have all the parts in yet. I've got the old tubes back in there and uh, they work okay. It could just sound a lot better with new ones. The cartridge is here, but I want to wait till next week to put the cartridge in. The tubes give you a little before and after sound sample just to see what kind of improvements we've made there. I'll refinish the top, get a varnish coat on that, install that extra input on the back somewhere for a CD player, and install a switch that switches out the FM. Uh, tuner input to the amplifier. I think it'll probably impedance match a little bit better than what the phono would. 
And uh, what else? Um, I guess that's uh, about it. So next week in part two, we'll wrap it all up. Until then. Zenith, where quality goes in before the name goes on. At least that's what they used to say. Today we're going to restore this old thing. <laughs>